And so I hope that you've been enjoying the life of Elisha, specifically Elisha. I know that some of you might know a little bit more about Elijah, but Elisha was the young man that took over the mantle or, or the place, the position of Elijah as as the prophet of Israel, as the leader of prophets, and, and the one that God used to speak through to the people. And, and God used him to do incredible things. We, why do we go to Elisha? Because he did incredible things, greater things for the Lord. But it wasn't because he was anything special. It wasn't that he somehow came from a special family, uh, that somehow he, he had uh, the special or, or perfect background to be used by God or the training. No. As we remember the story, he was simply uh, plowing the fields, just, just taking care of, of his parents' field. And one day Elijah comes to him. God tells Elijah, that's him. That's who's going to take over. That's who's going to take over the mantle. And so Elisha... He simply was used by God because he believed, because he was always available to God. He simply said, God, I don't know how you're going to do this, but yes, go for it. And when things seemed foolish and things seemed weird, Elisha said, okay, I'm still going to do it because God said it, not because it makes sense to me, and I'm still going to do it, and I'm still going to preach, and I'm still going to take those steps of faith and believe. And that's why God used him, not because he was anything special. He was other, uh, a complete opposite of that. He was very, very ordinary, but God used him because of his faith. So let me ask you a question today. How many times have you ever been just, that has another person just drove you crazy because they just don't do what you asked them to do? And, and you're just, yes, and uh, careful husbands, and careful wives. Yeah, whether it's your kids you tell them, go do that, and they just kind of stare back at you. Come on, go do it. Uh, or, 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 your, or your husband or your wife, and you tell them to do something. You ask them to do something. That turns into telling them to do something, and they still don't do it, and they still kind of wait around. But, but I'm talking about, have you ever been to the DMV? Oh. You ever been to the DMV or to the, or to the bank or, or to, or to uh, uh, a store? Anywhere where you expect customer service? And, and they're just kind of hanging out behind the desk. And they're just talking to each other and laughing. And they're having a great time. And you've got things to do. And you're just sitting there. You're just kind of waiting. And, 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 and you're thinking, why aren't they doing it? They have something to do. They have a responsibility. And they're just having a great time. Hello? Hello? And then they look at you and they laugh. And then they look at you and they stare at you like, like you're, you're somehow making their life worse. Just like, come on, you're getting paid for this. Let's go. You're at the bank, and they're just kind of walking around talking and, and gossiping about God knows what. They're probably doing something. But, but you're there, and you, and you want things to happen now. And, and why? Because you expect them to do it, and you've given them something to do, and you just feel so, so annoyed, and you almost feel like they're ignoring you. They're purposely ignoring you, and they're just kind of walking around having a good time. But how many times do, we, do you think that we act like this with God? That we want God to do great things, and we pray bold, awesome prayers. We say, God, move in our church, move in our city, move in our families. And I think he looks back at us and says, I'm ready to move, but when will you move? When are you going to do something about it? And, 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 it's, and, it's, and, and this has always been, it's not that God needs us, but he desires to use us. He wants to use us. He's a good father that way. It's always been a covenant, a relationship, an agreement. It's always been a Noah that, that believed in God and he prayed to God and said, God, save us, save your people. And God could have simply said, okay, I'll save you. But no, he wanted to have an agreement, a covenant, a connection, a relationship with a, with a human, with one man and when no one else believed, that one man did, and Noah decided to believe. And even though it took him a, a, over a hundred years, I mean, this just sounds crazy, but it took him all those years to build an ark when everyone else thought he was crazy, but he made a decision to make an agreement with God and believe. Not just pray, God save us, but he started to just uh, uh, hammer the nails in the wood. 
and believe and get the right wood. And not only that, but then go and, 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 and get the animals into the ark. And, and taking the steps of faith, even though it was foolish, it was weird, it was crazy. Everyone around him thought he was crazy. His own, his own family believed. And because of that, he left the legacy of faith to his own family that he said, even though no one else believes, I'm going to believe. And God blessed that covenant and he promised because of this one man, he blessed them with that rainbow. And he said, every time that rainbow comes out, it is a promise that I will never flood this earth again. Why? Because he made that agreement, that connection. So God is always waiting, ready to move, but he's waiting on us. Are we going to uh, uh, take the steps that are necessary so that he can move in our life? So he's ready and willing to do something in our, in our city, in our church. But I think he's looking at us and we're just kind of sitting back, waiting for him to do something. But he's saying, I want to use you. I want to use your hands and feet. I want to use your voice. I want to use you to make this difference. So we need to pray bold prayers. Yes. And I think that these are two things I want us to focus on today. We need to pray, pray bold prayers, not just small little prayers. Lord, just help me out through this day. Just encourage me or just, or just make the, the, the grass greener in my yard or, or just kind of take care of my kids. No, we're saying, Lord, make a difference through me. Make a difference in my family. May my children and my great-grandchildren and the future generations that I will never meet, may they be transformed and make a difference in this, in this city, in this world, for the glory of God. And so we're praying bold prayers, but we also need to take bold steps of faith. And so as we're doing these two things, I want us to look at 2 Kings once again. And let's go to chapter 5 today. And, and, and I love this, this passage, and, and the version I'm reading the, the, the verses from, I love how it's just simply, it's, it reads like a story. So I don't really have to say much. We're just going to read this story. And, and once again, we see the life of Elisha, the prophet Elisha, and he encounters a man. And that this man was, was waiting around on God or somebody, anybody, to fix his problems. And so here, the first verse, I love that it's only one verse, but it's a whole, gives you the whole context, the whole background of this story. And, and here we go in 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And so it says, now Naaman, that's an interesting name, uh, in 2019 it'd probably be, nah man, Naaman, that's my last joke on that, okay? Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. He's a great man. Because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a, val or a valiant soldier, very brave soldier. But, and he had a great big but. Sometimes we have these moments of but in our life that we just kind of, there is something going well, but something happens. But he had leprosy. And this is his problem. Now, this is a story like none other that we've been looking at. Why? Because this is the highest ranking man, the highest ranking guy in the army of Israel's enemy, Aaron. This is Israel's enemy, the ones that are going against Israel. So this Naaman is, is from the evil enemy, the ones who opposed the people of God. So in our, in our earthly understanding of religion, I mean, you would think that one plus one equals two. That's how we sometimes we think of how God should work. If he is part of the evil army and wanted Israel to be destroyed, then you would think that God did not want to bless him. That it was almost a punishment from God for leading Aram against Israel that God would have punished them with leprosy. But that God is not the God of Scripture. That God is a, a God of religion. The God of, that, that we somehow as humans make in our own image. And we say, well, if you're a good person, then God's going to bless you. If you're a bad person, then God hates you. But God does not love people less based on their tribe or, or on their own political party. Hello? 
He doesn't love them less on, on whether they, they serve God their whole life or, or, or fought against God their whole life. So please notice this today, that God is about to work in the life of someone who is opposing God's people. We've seen the life of these women in chapter 4, these women filled with faith, that they were willing to believe in God and God blessed them in their faithfulness. But now we're going to see the life of a man who actually was going against God and God still reached him. So point number one, and, and, and you can follow me there in your bulletin and, and fill in the blanks. Point number one, no matter how far we are from God, his love always runs towards us. How many of us can say amen to that? Amen. That is our story. He runs towards us. The Holy Spirit, God himself here on this earth, he is already at work. God is already working on people whether they realize it or not. God loved us before we ever loved him. And before we ever said, God, I need you, oh, years before, he had been working on us, working on us. There had been someone praying for you. There had been someone praying, Lord, meet him, go to him, go to her, go save her. And God had been working on us. Many times we had said, no, not right now, not right now, we don't need you. And then we experienced all the consequences. But God has been working on us. God is working and so God is working on their lives whether they, they, know, they know it or not. And, and God is, is always running after us. Now, now knowing this, knowing that God is already at work on them, this should shape how we interact with people, with people around us. How we should talk to them as Christians, knowing that God is working on their life already. How we should talk to our, to our co-workers, to our neighbors, to our classmates. Because God is always working on them. Our job, our responsibility, is to simply point them towards Jesus. Point them towards God. The God that is already at work in them right now. And, and uh, did you know that, that out of all the countries in the world, out of all the places in the world, that, that the global center of Christianity, where, where we would say God is moving in, in, in signs and wonders, miracles, great things are happening... The global center of Christianity right now is no longer Europe, it's no longer the United States. It is places like Africa and Asia. And, and there are so many men and women that are, that are seeing the glory of God, they're seeing signs and wonders, they are seeing miracles. I, I, I just shared a, a, a testimony out of Africa of an African pastor who had died and at his funeral he came back to life. And he is showing his, his death certificate. And, and it is a testimony of, of, of people that simply are saying, we can't rely on medicine, we can't rely on doctors, if either he saves us and heals us right now, or we die tomorrow, period. And so, so they are trusting in God 100%, and God is doing great things in, in countries like, like Africa. And, and, and for some reason, this is how God always works. He, he shows up to places where, where, there, is, where there is oppression, not just spiritual, but even also politically. And, and there is, there is true, true persecution. Not, not just, oh, somebody attacked me on Facebook and said something bad to me and offended me. Or, or a politician said something mean. No, I'm talking about true persecution. They, they know, they find out that you're a Christian and your head will be cut off. And, and it's in places like that that God sees their faithfulness, sees their, their, their true devotion, their, their, their passion for God, and God blesses them. And, 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 and so many more. Every time one dies, and this has been the history of Christianity, every time one dies, hundreds and thousands more come to Christ. You can't kill Christianity. Not even the gates of hell can come against the church of Jesus Christ. Now, now this is what's been happening here. And, and so we sometimes used to say, uh, uh, we, we're going to go take God. We're going to go take God to Africa. We're going to go take God to Latin America. We're, we're talking about missions. We're going to go take God to the Philippines. And, and we, we, we say things like that. But no, if we truly think about it, God's already there. God is working on them. God is already moving there in those places. I've, I've, been, I, I've read before that what we do as Christians, we're basically like uh, tourist guides that we're saying, you see that? That's God. You see that over there? That's God. You see what's been happening in your life? That's actually God that's been working already in your life. 
Paul did it. Paul, when he showed up to, to uh, Greece and they, they worshiped the unknown God, Paul just simply said, that God that you've been worshiping, that unknown God, his name is the Lord Yahweh, that God, Jesus Christ. He is the one true God and all your other gods bow down to that one God. And, and, and so, so this is our responsibility to simply go around and simply point towards God, let other people know who God is. Now, Amen, again, he has this, this huge problem in his life. This, this, in that sentence, it just stops. He was a great man. He was a great leader. He had won different battles, the, the highest commander, but he had leprosy. Now, leprosy was an incurable disease, and we hear about leprosy all the way back to the, the first few books of the Bible, specifically in Leviticus. We see that, that God even tells the people of Israel, out there in the desert, do not even get close to people that have skin disease because you will be impure and you will not be able to live. He knew that they needed to learn these kind of things while they were out in the desert because he wanted them to survive. And so this leprosy became not just a, a social, physical uh, um, problem, it became even religious. It was, they, were, they were casted out. They weren't even allowed to worship God the way they wanted to. Uh, and, and it was this painful disease. It was slow and painful. And it turned your skin into almost like scales. And, and these sores would come out and they would cover your skin. And those sores would go all around your skin and cover your skin. And they would turn white. And, and so much that, that lepers, their skin looked uh, like that, like the disease uh, albino, and, and, and they would be, they, their skin would turn from, a, from that, the original color just to this very, very uh, pale white. And, and, and basically what the disease was, it was skin attacking itself. It was killing itself. And so uh, their, their skin around their nose would be eaten out, and sometimes their, even their nose or their ears would fall off. And, and, and it became so much that even though it was painful, uh, at the same time, your skin uh, would stop feeling pain because you just became used to it. And so if they would cut themselves, they would cut a finger, they would cut an arm, maybe a, a foot or something, that, that they wouldn't even feel it and they would simply lose their fingers, lose their extremities, lose their, their, their body uh, because they just stopped feeling anymore. And so it was a, a physical, they stopped feeling physically, but obviously emotionally, spiritually, they stopped feeling. They were outcasted. They usually lived in, 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 in separate places, in different houses, if, if not out in the field somewhere, in caves. And, and, uh, and, and it was a terrible disease. And so now people with leprosy, had to live, like I said, in this isolation because it was so contagious. No one wanted to even, even hug a leper because it was, it, was, it was literally they could also get leprosy as well. So Naaman was the commander of the army, but he had to deal with this terrible disease. And now let's go to verses 2 and 3. Now, now bands of raiders from Aram, the bad guys, the evil guys, had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, to her, to her uh, slave master, if only my master, meaning Naaman, would see the prophet Elisha, who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now, what was it that started this process of healing for Naaman? It was the faith of this young girl, that God used the heart of this young girl, this little girl, although she had been kidnapped by the enemy army, now she was found there as a, as a slave, and instead of being bitter and angry and vengeful, she, be, she started to share the love of God that was already in her. She was the initiator of hope to Naaman. Isn't that amazing? That this girl, who was obviously brought up in the ways of God, that she had faith in God, that she could have seen the attack of the enemy as, as something negative, but she saw it as an opportunity to share God's love with those around her. 
I think that sometimes we're too quickly in to say, the devil is doing this, the devil is doing that, and we give all the glory to the devil, instead of saying, hey, if the devil wanted to do this to attack me, I'm going to use this for, the, for God's glory. And God does that. And God's greater than that. And every time we, seem, we think that something bad is happening in our life, maybe it's simply God allowing these moments to happen so that someone else could get to know who God is. We talked a lot about that last week, uh, even the testimonies that were given, that, that sometimes God, yes, He could heal us at home, but sometimes He'd rather us be healed at the hospital or, or, or later on in life so that others could see God's glory, so that others could see that what, what, what He can do, He could also do it in their own life. And so here we see this young girl who is a slave, but she brings hope to, to, to Naaman. What, what if you were known for that? This girl, we never hear anything else about her. She was simply a young girl that had faith, that shared with Naaman, God could heal you. God could use the prophet Elisha to heal you. What if we were known for that? Instead of becoming bitter or frustrated by the things around us, frustrated at, 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 at politics, frust, frustrated at economics, frustrated at the, at, at the problems at work, wouldn't it be great if... if Every time someone bumped into us, that they bumped into Jesus. Every time they got to know us, they got to know Jesus. Wouldn't it be great? And I'm not talking about just all, all the time, just Jesus, Jesus, say, but living out what Jesus means. Being an actual Christian. So that every time someone is in need, where do they go? They go to you. Because they know that there's something different in you. This is what this girl was doing. So look at verse 4 and 6. Now Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. Now his master, his leader, he said, By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. He's getting, they're getting ready to, to impress the king of Israel so that he can move on Naaman's behalf. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Now verse 7, As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. He's thinking, I obviously can't heal. So he's, he's telling me that I don't have the power to do something he's asking me to do. So he's trying to make me look foolish. I can't do this myself, he's thinking. So, so he's just trying to attack me, trying to mess with me, trying to pick a fight. So verse 8, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes, king? Elisha was pretty close to the king of Israel. Have the man come to me. Tell him to come and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. So he shows up. Can you just imagine? Here comes Naaman with all these horses and chariots. And he comes in and, and he's ready. I mean, he's got his whole army behind him. And he shows up to this little humble house of the prophet Elisha. Now here, though, we see these two snapshots, these two stories of, 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 of people who thought that they could make, manipulate God to do what they wanted Him to do. To, to do whatever they wanted on their own commands. The king of, of, of Aram, first of all, he's trying to buy God. He's trying to pay so that God could move. Uh, if you, some commentators, as I was studying this, they say that if you added all the clothing and all the gold that, that Naaman was taking with him to impress the king of Israel, if you added it all up, it was about one, uh, $1.2 million today. So, I mean, he's coming with million dollars to try to impress the other king, to try to impress him and say, okay, yes, we will do this for you, or our God will do this for you because you have paid the right amount. Now, I thank God that he doesn't simply work this way. I thank God that we can't pay him off. 
that we somehow give a, a certain amount. Doesn't matter what people have said on TV. Doesn't matter what the televangelists have said. Doesn't matter if they've lied to you. It's simply a lie. That's simply man trying to figure out God and say, if you give $10,000 right now, call the 1-800 number and God will heal your family. No, come on. That's just not how God works. Now, now even, even when we do write a check, He cares about our heart. Even when we do give an offering, he, 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 he sees it. He wants it more to be worship unto Him, that He will use every single penny for His glory. But we're not trying to buy Him. We're not trying to impress Him. We're not trying to say, wow, look, here you go, God. Here's, here's all of these, my millions of dollars to try to impress you. Now you have to move on my behalf. But we expect Him to move because we, we somehow... Uh, we, we, or we think we expect Him to move because we're going to give Him the right amount. Our offering is, is not a payment, is not a tip to God. We do it out of worship to Him. And He cares about our heart. But this man, he simply thought, if I give the right amount, Naaman's going to be healed. I need my commander, my commanding officer, to be in charge again and to go and fight some more battles. He's a good one. I'm going to pay so that he could get healed and we could keep winning more, more battles. Now, the second person, though, is Naaman himself. He rides his horses, like I said, and chariots filled with pride. And, and he's saying, yeah, even though I'm sick, I'm still being supported by the king. I have all of this riches, power. I, I'm the man. And I'm going to show up and God's, God, this God of Israel, whoever he is, he better heal me. He better do it the way I want it. And he shows up to Elisha and he tells him, heal me now. Come on. So he's basically demanding God. And again, God doesn't work that way. We can't just come to him, we can't pay him off, and we can't demand. He doesn't work that way. So verse 10, I love Elisha. Elisha doesn't even come out to meet the great commander, the, the, the commander of the, of the army. He doesn't even come out, even though, again, Elisha, he could have been a, a, a simple, uh, a selfish man and said, oh, he's coming with $1.2 million. I'm going to go out and talk to him. Praise the Lord. No, he simply stays back and it says in verse, verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger to say to him. He doesn't even meet him. He sends someone else. And the messenger goes and tells him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, in the Jordan River. The same Jordan River we've heard about throughout the Old Testament. And your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Now, think about how he would have felt. This is why it says it this way in verse 11. But Naaman went away angry. He, he, he hears this message, not even from Elisha, but from his messenger. And he tells him, go and dip yourself into the, into the river and you're going to be cleansed. You're going to be clean. And he, and he walks away angry. Why? And he says, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand, abracadabra. <laughs> he expected him to just kind of wave his hand over him, over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. And then he even says, are not Abana and Farpar, these are other, other more beautiful rivers, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? He wants me to go into Jordan River? Couldn't I wash in them and, and be cleansed in those beautiful rivers? So he turned and he went off in a rage. He went off. He expected, he demanded, he wanted things done his own way. So Naaman is saying, I'll do anything else, God, but I'm not going to do that. You're telling me to do that, God? You're telling me to do that, Elisha? No, no, no. I'm not going to do that. Now, now these rivers that are named, like I said, they're beautiful. They're, they're beautiful, clean rivers. The Jordan River in that time is a little bit bigger than what we have today. It's, it's, it's dried up a little bit of what, if you go to Israel today. But even in that time, it was, it was more of a creek. It was more something small compared to the other rivers. And, and uh, back then, and even more so now, if you try to go, a lot of, a lot of us say, I, can't, I wish one day I could go to Israel and be baptized in the Jordan River, in the same place where Jesus was baptized, and, and I want to go through that. If you go, a lot of people are shocked because it's actually pretty dirty today. And it's, and it's not just dirty and not just pollution, but, but, it's, but it's muddy. 
and it's small and it's kind of gross and you have to take some 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 weird uh, uh, steps down into this this water and and it almost feels like you're to get you're just going to come out just filthy and and Naaman is thinking how dare this God of Israel tell me does he not know who I am does he not know who I represent? Does he not know the things I've done? How dare that God tell me to go into those waters? So he's probably thinking all of that is beneath me. Does Elisha not know who I am? Does he not know where I'm from? How dare he tell me to do these things? Ugh, it's, it, this is not for me. Now he's probably thinking also, not just in his pride, he's probably also thinking this this. Israelite, Elisha, is trying to make a fool out of me. He knows that I'm from the enemy army. He knows that I'm coming from, from their side. And he's trying to make a fool out of me, trying to go get me and, and dunk myself into the Jordan River. And I'm going to come out exactly the same. He's just going to make a fool out of me. He's trying to embarrass me. So he, 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 he at the end of all this, Eli, uh, or Naaman, he was simply trying to prescribe his own healing. I think that we do that sometimes with God still today. We go to him and say, okay, God, if I go to this specific church, if I go to this specific revival, and there's that healer, there's that, there's that preacher, and I'm going to go and he's going to put his, his hand on me. I, I've shared with you this before. There, th at, the, at the church where, we, where I grew up in Arizona, there was, there was people that, that had come from other traditions where they had priests and, and the priests would, would bless them. And so they would come up to the front every single Sunday and, and, and ask for prayer. But then they would go and, and they would yell at the pastor. They would say, Father! Father, come over here. And they would grab his hand and they would place it on their head. Because they were used to the priest putting their head of their hand on their head and, 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 and blessing them that way. So they were going up every single week up to the front uh, looking for, for the blessing. Because they thought, well, this is how it's supposed to be done. This is the ritual. If I light the candle, if I, if I go and I, and I pray so many prayers and, and I recite these verses, that somehow this is how one plus one equals two. If I do this plus this, then God will give me the miracle. And so we expect things to happen our way. And God is telling Naaman, no, I want you to go into that river, even though it may be foolish. And, and, and he wanted God to do the supernatural, but he wasn't willing to take the natural steps to get his healing. And I think that we sometimes, again, want God to do the supernatural in our life and in our family, but we're not willing to do the natural things. What do I mean, what do I mean by that? We sometimes expect, God, save my kids, save my family, save my marriage. You got husbands saying, God, I can't, I can't work with this woman anymore. God, heal my marriage, save my marriage, help us, bring us together. And God says, I'm ready and willing to do it. But the, they never talk to each other. Or he just never goes home after. Or he's still messing around with other people, with other women. And, and, and they're not willing to make the, the appropriate steps, the steps that need to be done so that God could then do the miracle. And so, and, or, or we're somehow saying, God, uh, take care of my kids. And we expect church and, and kids' church or, or youth pastors or pastors to take care of, of, of kids. And, and we're not willing to parent our own children at home. And so we want someone to take care of it. God, go for it. Take care of my kids. May they be great men and women of God. But we're not willing to take the, the simple, natural steps of being an example of who God is. And so, so here... He, he simply went home unhealed. He went off. I like how it describes him. He went off. He went unhealed because he wasn't willing to be humble. And the second point there in your notes, God wants us to participate in the greater things he wants to do. God wants us to participate. Again, I mentioned Noah. But we could talk about Noah, we could talk about Abraham, we could, we could, we could talk about David, we, every single disciple. These men and women, they simply participated in what God was doing. He wants you to see His love and His power in your own life. He doesn't want you to simply say, God, go for it, do it. No, He wants you to be part of it. Isn't that more beautiful though? Isn't that much, much better for us? He wants us to be part of the miracle. He wants you to participate so that you can finally realize that He is God. 
Because sometimes we simply, and God is sometimes so good. More because he, so there's, there's a mom, for example, that's, that, that, that hasn't been to church, hasn't had a relationship with God for years, but, but she cries out to God, God, heal my daughter, she is dying. And God, out of mercy, out of his love, love for that girl, he'll heal her and she is healed. But that woman hasn't had a true relationship with God. And so nothing has changed in her life. And we see it all the time. There's, there, the miracles happen in our lives or in our families, and we just kind of go back to do the same thing. Because sometimes He'll allow things to, to delay so that He could allow us to recognize that He is God. That He is not just the miracle maker, the, the magician, the, 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 the genie that just kind of works on our own demand, with our own words, and we say, God, I want you to do it this way, and this way, and this way. No, He wants us to go through the process with Him so that we can get to know who He is, that He truly is God. God wants us to, to have a greater influence in our community. God, God wants us to do greater things, but He wants us to go with Him. What are the things that we need to do right now? As, as we've been talking about getting prepared, getting ready, uh, 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 being trained, literally trained on how to serve better in this church, we need to take those steps. And I thank God again what I said about you showing up last Sunday night saying, yes, I want to serve, but I want to do it the right way. I want to do it the biblical way. Uh, and, and I want to be committed. And I want to, and when I, I want to be part of what God is doing. So we have to take those simple, uh, natural steps. So again, we're asking, how can we double in size to make a greater impact as a church? What are the simple things that we need to do? Because at the end of it all, it's not about simply filling a building, but it's about making a, a, being a change in people's lives. It's not about asking God for more people. God says, yes, I'll do that. But, but get off the bench and, and participate. Do something about it. My, my, my friend in, in Richmond this morning, his, his sermon title is, Get Off the Couch. <laughs> And, and basically, he's preaching the same thing because the Lord is calling his people these last days because Jesus is coming back soon. And, and he wants to see us working, find us working, find us serving, doing everything possible so that more than enough, everyone, not just us, not just me and my family, but everyone around us, go with him. He wants us to participate. He wants to do things through you. He wants us to put our, our, our resources to work and start getting to do these things that God has called us to do. Faith is not just, just throwing up a prayer. He wants us to participate. Again, faith without works, it is dead. Yes, we don't work to impress Him and then we have salvation. No, we work and we serve and we do everything because we're thankful. And we want others to know of the beautiful, good God that He is. So look at verse 13. I love these guys. Naaman's servants. His servants. As I read this, this might mean something else to others, but as I've been reading this, it reminds me of, uh, of our brothers and sisters in church. Church people, Christian friends, that we need someone else sometimes. Because sometimes we're too proud on our own. But we need somebody else to come and encourage us. That's why church is important. That's why, that's why a, a Christian family is important. And so the servants went to him and said, My father, or basically calling him uh, uh, master, my father, if the prophet has told you to do some great things, would you not have done it? If he had told you, Oh, climb this mountain. Or, or, or go into one of those beautiful rivers. Do something great. Wouldn't you have done it? And they knew he would have said, yes, why? He was a prideful man. Go do that. How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? Notice that. He came for a cure. He came to just fix his out, outward skin. He wanted the, the skin to be cleansed or, or, or just cured. But he left cleansed. Not just outwardly, but inwardly. So verse 14, so he went down, he said, okay, you're right, I would have. And he felt humbled enough because his own servants called him out on it. He says, you're right. So he goes, and he goes down, and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. 
He did not even just, and he got, and it was good with some wrinkles. No, he was cleansed and clean so that his skin looked like a young boy. He restored him all the way back to his own youth. That's what God does. So I see that in some of us. Because sometimes I think that we're kind of just getting old and just tired and uh, I don't, uh, I'm just hopeless. And then God gives us new life. And we're just like, yeah, so it doesn't matter if you're 90, 100 years old. You still got the joy of the Lord and the enthusiasm of the Lord. He restores us back into our youth. But what if this man, what if Naaman would have stopped? What if he would have stopped? Because when he first went in, the first time he dips himself in and he comes out, nothing. And he knows his servants are looking and he's thinking, oh my it's Elisha make, making a fool of me. He goes in, comes out, nothing. Third, fourth, fifth time, nothing. Skin looks exactly the same. Nothing's happening. And he gets to his sixth time and he's probably, I'm stopping. What if you would have stopped? What if we would have stopped on the sixth time before nothing happened? Now, the question is this morning, because sometimes, again, we're praying, we're saying, Lord, do this, but God is saying, keep going. Keep going, keep praying, keep believing. Why? Because He is molding us. He is strengthening us. Because He could fill this place up or He could heal your family. He could save your marriage. He could save your children right now. But He is molding us. He is strengthening us. He is doing something in us first. I love your testimonies that you say, I've been praying for my children. I've been praying for my grandchildren for years. But I know that God's about to do something. And that about to do might be next month. Might be next year, might be in the next few years, but he's going to do it. And you hold on to those promises. So Naaman, he could have stopped, but he said seven, so I'm going to keep going. Sometimes we stop at, at six. There's a great sermon that, that says that, we, that we, when, when the people of Israel were, were surrounding Jericho, again, foolish, weird. Why would, it, would God just want us to surround Jericho, surround these walls, and simply worship and sing, and, and, and just keep walking around and march around the city of Jericho, and you went four times, five times, six times, And by the sixth time, they could have stopped and said, this isn't working, Joshua. This isn't working. But no, they kept on going and it said, the seventh time, shout, for the city is yours. And they kept on, and they shouted, Lord, yes, this is ours. And as they went around the seventh time, even though it was foolish, it was not no less foolish the seventh time than it was the first time. But they kept on going. And by the seventh time, they had trusted in God. The first time they were probably thinking, maybe this is, maybe if we walk this specific way, that's how it's going to work. Maybe if we, if we walk faster, maybe it'll work quicker. They were trying to probably figure out, this is what we do as humans, we're trying to figure out the ritual, the routine, the, the thing. And, and God wants us to just trust in who He is. And so that by the seventh time they thought, oh, none of it is working, so we're just going to keep on trusting Him and working and believe that what He said is going to happen. And when they kept on going, by the seventh time they shouted and the walls start tumbling down. And so He wants us to not stop too early. We give up too soon. We, keep up, we, keep, we, we give up praying too soon. We, keep, we, we give up our faith too soon. And Naaman goes in the seventh time. Do you trust Him enough to stay in the process? Don't go home with the same condition this morning. Don't go home with the same same feeling of pride this morning. Go through it even though you don't feel anything. Or you might not see things working at the moment. And I know that we say it every week, keep worshiping. Keep praying, keep believing, and you go week after week, and you sometimes you just don't see it. You might not even feel anything. Some weeks you feel something, and it encourages you, and you keep going. But we don't, sp- you, we, don't, we don't trust in feelings. We don't trust even in miracles. We trust in God. And we're going to focus on Him, and we're going to keep our eyes on Him. And even though we might not feel it, and we, we keep on going, but do you trust Him? Even when it's not working, even when it seems like it's not working, it is working. He is moving. He's doing things behind the scenes. He's doing things that no one else sees. Mom, don't stop praying for your son. Father, don't stop praying for your for your daughter. Uh, uh, Wife, don't start praying. Don't stop praying for your for your husband. Keep believing. Keep believing. Church, don't stop praying for Stockton. 
We got to keep on believing, even if when it doesn't feel like it's working, even when we feel like sometimes we show up to church and things have been stolen, things have been broken in, and 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 we find sometimes we'll find uh, uh, needles or 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 we'll find uh, just trash and things, even in our own church parking lot, and we just find it. We feel discouraged, but you know what? God's saying, keep believing, keep moving forward, keep working, even when it doesn't make sense. Keep believing because we trust in Him. We're trusting in Him. Don't stop short of your miracle this morning. Keep worshiping. Keep believing. Keep raising your arms even if it doesn't make sense. And the last thing this morning, number three. Great things happen when God's power connects with your obedience. Again, He wants us to do a, he wants to do a covenant with us. He wants to do an agreement with us. I prayed that before. We've said, Lord, you know our hearts. We're just simply saying, God, if this is a building where people could come and they could experience the presence of God and their life will be changed forever and their family's life will be changed and their neighborhood will change simply because we're making this building available for your presence, then God, let this be a place for you to make this your throne so that the king of kings could come into this house and and know that we're not about money we're not about fame we're not about names we're not about anything else we're not about musicians and preachers we're about him we're not about guest speakers and concerts we'll do all that sure but we're not about that we're about jesus so when we want to make this building available for him and we're simply saying you come lord you come, and, and, and I know that He wants to make that agreement with us because when, we, when He connects with us, His power and His obedience, that's when greater things happen. It was after He took the steps, that's when, when He finally took the steps of obedience that He got it. It was finally after He said, yes, I'm going to do it. This, this seems foolish to me. This seems weird. And, and, and my own servants are calling me out of my pride. Fine. I'm going to go and I'm going to try this out. In his pain, he was prideful. Church, we do that. In our own pain, people are, are suffering and they're saying, I'm not going to lift my hands and worship. <laughs> I'm not going to believe and pray. I'm not going to keep going to church. In their own pain, there is still pride in their suffering. And they're still thinking, this is who I am. Does the, does the pastor, does that church not know who my name is or where I come from? And God's saying, just, just surrender already. What's wrong? <laughs> In verse 15, this is it. More than a healing miracle, something greater happens after all of this. Because yes, he comes out. And he's been restored all the way back to his youth like a young boy, almost like, like faith. Because even God says, Jesus himself said it, don't push away the children. I want, that, I want you to be more like children, have that kind of childlike faith. And I think that's what happens to him, not just physically. He then be, has this childlike faith in him. Look at verse 15. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. Not just him. Now all of his attendants. So again, when God does something in your life, it's not just for you, it's for your family, it's for your coworkers, it's for people around you, your friends, your neighbors. And all of his attendants went back to the men of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please, then he starts to simply try to try to pay still. He's still. There's still some things that he needs to This isn't automatic. Sometimes we think that we're just going to start thinking perfectly, biblically. No. We've been brought up in this weird culture, in this, in this society, and, and this is the things that they've taught us. So we've got we to gotta learn how to be a new birth, a new person, a new man, a new woman. And so here, he's still trying to do it the old way. And out of his gratitude, uh, he says, so please accept the gift from your servant. Now, Naaman is no longer this prideful man. He is, he is saying, I am your servant, Elisha. The prophet answered, verse 16, again, we see the humility in Elisha. As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. 
I'm going to ask Ashley if you could come up. We're going to finish this morning. But Elisha wanted him to know that it was God's grace that freed him. It wasn't Elisha. It wasn't his power. It wasn't anything else. And it wasn't that you had to pay for this, that his grace was free. He wanted him to know, no, no, you don't have to pay anything. This is between you and God, and God healed you freely. He didn't need a payment. There was now a complete healing in Naaman. But a complete, not just a healing, but it was a complete restoration. His whole mind, his soul, his body, everything changed. That's what God does. We expect and we want Him to fix our problems, and He will. But while He does that, He changes everything on the inside. There is no other God in all the world, He says. This is why God wants us to participate, to take those steps, bold steps of obedience. Because when we do that, then we recognize that there is no other God. That it could have been any other way, but no, no, no. That there is no other God. It's not even the God of medicine. It's not even the God of money. It's not even the God of, of, of any other kind of spirituality. That there is no other God. In order to see God do great things, we need to again pray bold prayers. Believe. Naaman at least had that, that he had to take those steps to get to Elisha's house. He wanted to do it his way, but at least he was trying to get there. And as he was getting there, so we need to pray bold prayers, but we also need to take bold steps of obedience. Bold steps of faith. And even if it feels foolish, even if it, seems, if it feels weird, we're going to believe and trust that God has the last word. What are the steps He's calling you to take this morning? Some of us just need to be honest with God. Some of us just need to start being just open with God. Maybe this morning you're saying, I don't really need a, a, a physical, I'm, I'm not sick, a physical healing. I don't, I don't really need a... A financial provision. You're, you're saying, I'm good right now. But you know that inside of your heart, there's still something going on. That you just need to confess. You just need to finally accept that you just can't anymore by yourself. That you need God. That you need Him. This morning, right there where you're at, why don't we just surrender why don't we raise our hands in, in a symbol of surrender towards Him? Father, the simple act of us lifting up our hands in prayer, in worship, to a God that we can't see with our physical eyes, that simple act of being in a church building this morning, seems foolish to the world and even to us sometimes. It doesn't make sense, God, we're here, and we trust you.